We're delighted today to have Jason Ludington with us uh, to give a talk entitled Picture the Impossible. Promises to be very interesting. Jason is an associate professor at Bucknell and he's currently on a two year research uh, leave and, and he has a fellowship um, studying or preparing a book on the philosophy of magic and other arts of impossibility um, at the University of Antwerp. And his book is already under contract with MIT Press. Jason's main areas of interest are aesthetics and philosophy of art and the philosophy of perception. So we're delighted to have you with us today, Jason, and I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Eric. And um, first, can you hear me okay? Good, great. Um, I'm delighted to be here with you today. And thanks to Eric and Clotilde and all of the organizers of the Scottish Aesthetics Forum for the invitation. Um, thanks to all of you for um, joining me wherever you are and whenever you are. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So hopefully you should be seeing the correct audience view now of my slides. Is that right, Clotilde, we're good? Okay, great. So as, uh, as Eric mentioned, um, this is part of a larger project um, dealing with the aesthetics of impossibility more broadly. And uh, I got into it by thinking about magic and my interests have since broadened to include other areas of uh, the aesthetic realm where impossibility and the experience of, a, of impossibility or a seeming experience of impossibility um, is a core element of our aesthetic experience. So today I wanna to talk about uh, impossible figures. And this will be a way to begin talking about certain types of elements of our experience of visual art more broadly, but I'm just gonna gesture at that at the very end. When it comes to talking about impossible figures, there's really only one person you can really begin with. And that is, oh, let's see, slides. This guy, Oskar Reutersvold. Reutersvold uh, is a Swede, um, born in 1915, died in 2002, and was professor of art history and theory at Lund University. And I actually recently discovered, I didn't know this early on when I knew a lot of his artwork, I didn't know that he was actually publishing in, of all places, the Journal of Aesthetics and Art Criticism in the 1950s. But he's really not best known for his scholarship, he's best known for his artwork. And in particular, for the uh, enormously, uh, enormous output and enormously influential output of uh, impossible figure uh, drawings and paintings. So I'll start with this image. This is um, from 1968, titled Opus One. And it's a 1968 rendering of an impossible figure that Rogersved created in 1934. It's generally accepted as the first impossible triangle or the discovery of the impossible triangle. And throughout his artistic career, Rogersved would create thousands of impossible figures, a um, few of which would later adorn a series of Swedish postage stamps. But despite his incredible output and despite his influence within a certain sort of, sort of uh, uh, a certain uh, part of the artistic community, uh, impossible figures are instead associated first with these guys. These are the Penroses, Lionel and Roger Penrose, who in 1958 published this article in the British Journal of Psychology. Um, and on a second. so this was the first um, actual um, academic paper um, discussing uh, impossible figures. And Penrose, uh, Roger in this case, actually discovered independently of Rogersverd, didn't know about Rogersverd at all, discovered the impossible triangle independently of Rogersverd. And that's what led to this publication. Uh, other figures that were included in the publication include these linked impossible triangles and these impossible stairs. Since this was, was really the first appearance of these in the academic literature, um, the impossible triangle has come to be known as the Penrose Triangle and the Impossible Stairs have come to be known as the Penrose Stairs, despite, of course, 
in this case, in both cases, actually, Roger's very its priority. Um, the stairs are based on the same geometric uh, principle as the, as the triangle. So they're known as the Penrose Triangle and the Penrose Stairs. But of course, in the popular imagination, popular mind, um, impossible figures are primarily associated with this guy, um, M.C. Escher. And uh, impossible figures figure in three of his best known works. Belvedere from 1958, Ascending and Descending from 1960, and Waterfall from 1961. In fact, you can see in Ascending and Descending um, the, um, the Penrose Stairs, and um, Escher was actually influenced by uh, the Penrose publication to incorporate that. It's the same type of stairway that's depicted um, in the uh, in the Penrose article, and uh, Roger Sverd himself actually, incidentally, was not especially impressed with the Penrose stairs. He thought that they were uh, it was a pretty poor artistic rendering of the impossible stairs, and so didn't really like the Escher incorporation here. Though he did uh, have a great deal of admiration for Escher and actually sent Escher some of his work, but uh, never heard back from him. Here, at waterfall. You can see this incorporates uh, impossible triangle geometry. And Escher himself, though, was not really deeply interested in impossible figures. He only actually created one impossible figure that was original with him, which is the impossible cube in Belvedere. So this is a close up of that. And in general, unlike Rogersfeld, for Escher and Penrose, impossible figures were merely a passing interest. And while Penrose was concerned primarily with the mathematics of impossible figures and Escher integrated them into familiar human scenes, Reutersverd's abstract minimalist renderings express a fascination with the figures themselves. Free of adornment, they attract and command the eye and exhibit a strange and peculiar beauty. And here you can see that um, Rogers Red used so-called Japanese perspective in which lines that recede are drawn parallel to each other. So some of his works, and you can see here in the, in the bottom left, um, say perspective Japanese here, number 293A. Here's a painting. Another drawing. And um, by the way, Roy Jesuit never used a straight edge. All of these um, are freehand drawings and they were primarily done on his train commute. So you can imagine trying to do these incredibly delicate and precise renderings while sitting on a moving train. This is one from his Impossible Window series. And one more. So all of this is by way of introducing the question that I want to discuss today, which is this. Why do we find impossible figures so visually compelling? The emphasis here is on visually compelling. My concern here is the specifically aesthetic appeal of impossible figures. Mathematicians and logicians have studied them for their mathematical and logical properties, psychologists for what they reveal about the visual system, and philosophers in part for what they tell us about the limits of the imagination. But we value them mainly, of course, as things to look at. And this is what I want to understand. That there is something here to be explained, something distinctive about impossible figures is strongly suggested by the following. Consider Escher. Only three, these three of Escher's 448 lithographs include impossible figures. Yet they're among his best known and best loved works. Since they're not otherwise visually remarkable, as, at least as far as Escher's go, what explains this is presumably their inclusion of impossible figures, which again really forces us to deal with the question, what's the appeal? And strangely, this topic seems to have attracted um, virtually no attention at all. So here's my goal, or this rather the structure of the talk. 
I'm going to work in three stages using three methods. First, I'm going to define the domain of investigation. I'm going to answer the question, what is an impossible figure? Answering this will require a form of conceptual analysis and raise a variety of interesting philosophical issues. Second, I'm going to engage in a bit of sort of introspection or phenomenology. I'll ask about the experience of looking at impossible figures and report on mine. Finally, I'm going to appeal to results from experimental psychology to develop an empirically grounded hypothesis about the visual fear, uh, appeal of impossible figures. And if things go well, we'll learn not something not only about um, impossible figures, uh, but about ourselves and about how and why we look at visual art in general. So let's start right away with this question. What is an impossible figure? Well, first of all, impossible figures are not impossible, right? Roger Sverd made thousands. What's impossible is what the figure depicts. But we have to be careful. Consider this picture. Rene Magritte's Le Chateau des Pyrénées. This depicts an impossible scene, but it doesn't include an impossible figure. Why not? Well, the impossibility is of the wrong sort. Impossible figures depict objects that are geometrically impossible. So consider this picture. Um, Brown Impossible Stairs by Oscar Wojtyserd. If you start at any point on these stairs, say where the blue dot is, and you ascend, and you make a full circuit, ascending continuously, you return to the same point. This means that a geometrical description of the stairway is inconsistent, and so entails a contradiction. By contrast, this scene is perfectly consistent. It entails no contradictions at all. Of course, it does depict a world with different physical laws, but that world and the scene depicted in this uh, picture uh, is perfectly consistent. That said, we still have to be careful. Not just any picture of a geometrically impossible object counts as an impossible figure. For example, consider this picture of a far off impossible triangle. There it is. This depicts an impossible triangle, but it's not an impossible figure. And it doesn't help to insist that the picture must be a close up. Here's a square circle viewed from the side. Again, this is not an impossible figure. But what's the reason, though? The reason is that it doesn't display the object's impossibility. That's the whole point, right? The point of an impossible figure is to make geometrical inconsistencies available for visual inspection and exploration. So inspired by these reflections, here's my suggested definition. An impossible figure is defined as a picture of a geometrically impossible object that as depicted is visibly geometrically impossible. So before we move on, I wanna talk a bit about this definition. So first, on the assumption that displaying geometrical impossibility is the core aesthetic function of an impossible figure, then since impossibilities can be more or less visible, that means impossible figures can be more or less successful. For example, here we have what I think are some really strong cases. Impossibilities of these uh, objects is really vividly displayed in these depictions. But in Rogers Verde's oeuvre, there's room for some weaker cases. So here's one. Um, I think that the impossibility of this image is not as, I mean, of this object is not as visible. I think it's, it's interesting to explore visually and the impossibilities are multiple um, but I think that if what we're interested in is visual displays of impossible, impossibility, this is, is, is less effective. Um, in a way, you might just think that as a, as a rule in general, that complexity, that the complexity of the image reduces the visibility of the impossibility. Consider this image 
or similarly this one. At a glance, nothing looks wrong. But if you look closely at it, you will see that this cube is above this cube, which is above this cube. But this cube is at the same height as this cube, which is at the same height as this cube, which is at the same height as this cube. Can you see where my cursor is? Is that showing up? Good. And the same height of this cube. So these cubes are both above each other and on the same plane. I'm not tied to the claim that these are weaker cases, um, but um, I do think that there's a very good reason why most of Roger's Wade's work is much visually simpler than these images. And I think it has to do with the, the, uh, the degree to which they are effective at displaying impossibility. So at the same time, um, if impossibilities can be more or less visible, there may also be unclear cases. Here's an interesting example. This impossible truncated pyramid. For most people, most of the time, if you look at this as a picture of a pyramid, it doesn't look impossible, but it actually, the structure violates the law that three non-parallel planes always intersect at a single point. It seems to me that this impossibility is not obviously visible. I think you can work yourself into a position where you can see the impossibility here, but it's, it's not obviously visible. So, um, one more thing about the definition before moving on. Um, one thing to notice about it is that it makes no mention of the notion of illusion. Yet, impossible figures are often classified as illusions. Penrose and Penrose did this, uh, Graham Priest in a 1999 pa paper um, about perceiving contradictions um, describes them as illusions. But this is a mistake. And I think it's relatively easy to see why. An illusion is something with a misleading appearance. Um, so for example, take the Muller liar lines, appearances to the contrary, those horizontals are of the same length. By contrast, in Rogers Red's triangle, there's nothing misleading about the lines and colors on the page. Everything is just as it appears. So it's not an illusion. Still, there is a close and interesting relationship between impossible figures and illusions. And you can see that in this image. This is a, a series of pictures of a sculpture in Perth, Australia. And uh, seen from the right angle, right? This, this sculpture presents a convincing illusion of an impossible triangle. What this shows is that even if it's impossible to build the objects we see in Rogersved's pictures, it's always possible to build objects that from certain angles look like those objects. This might lead you to have a certain concern about my way I'm describing impossible figures. You might think that what we should say here is that impossible figures are actually pictures of possible objects seen from angles that make them look impossible. In this case, even if impossible figures are not illusions, they are pictures of illusions. And some people have been quite attracted to this sort of view because they've been bothered by the idea that we can actually produce pictures of geometrical impossibilities. But in the end, this reasoning, I think, is hard to motivate. First, again, consider Magritte. It's perfectly possible to build an object that looks like an impossible floating rock. Ask a magician. But this doesn't mean that Magritte's painting depicts the illusion of a floating rock, right? For the same reason, we shouldn't say that impossible figures are pictures of structures that merely look impossible. Instead, they're pictures of geometrically impossible objects. You can't actually build what they depict, but you can build things that look like them. Still, you might be uneasy with this idea that pictures can really depict contradictory circumstances. And some philosophers have worried about this. John Kolvicki in his 2006 book is concerned about it. And in a recent paper, Andreas Elpidoru um, seems to be worried about it too. Um, to be fair, uh, John has um, revised his view since then. He's now not really worried about this. 
seems to be happy with this idea. Um, so, uh, but certainly, um, if you want to look for some skepticism about this, um, look for look. You can check out these 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 uh, these sources. But really, again, it's hard to see what the problem is supposed to be. And um, in case you're worried, though, in case you, you feel some sympathy for the, the old Kovic yale Vidor line here, um, here's an argument. How do we fix the content of a picture? Well, here's one view following Volheim. What a picture depicts is what is correctly seen in it, where the relevant standard of correctness is set by the fulfilled intentions of the artist. Well, what's the intention? Reuters explicitly rejects the idea that his works do not depict impossible objects. Instead, he says he aims to give the impossibility of these absurd phenomena adequate expression in two-dimensional pictures. Is the intention fulfilled? Well, yes, it looks, I would mean, say spectacularly so, right? We can see impossible objects in his pictures. Moreover, we do so see in and do so as if by default. Um, if you're looking at Rodgers' triangle, I think you have to work very hard to see it as a possible object from an angle from which it looks impossible. So anybody who uh, resists this idea that we uh, that impossible figures depict um, geometrically uh, uh, inconsistent um, objects. It seems like the burden of proof is really is really on them. OK, now I'm going to switch. The, now that we've kind of defined the domain, I'm going to switch to this exercise in, in phenomenology that I promised. And I'm going to start with, um, with Reuters Verde's triangle. And um, here I'm just going to actually read from a description of this that I, that I wrote up. And I invite you, as I, as I, um, as I, as I read through this and I, I go through the slides here, um, to follow along and to see if you experience things in the same way. And if not, why not? Uh, if not, how not? And we can discuss that uh, later. So let's uh, start with the triangle. First, I visually register a triangle composed of cubes, but I notice almost immediately that it looks wrong. And I find myself trying to make sense visually of what I see. I follow each side of the triangle taking in the orderly and regular relationship between the cubes. But as soon as I try to grasp the shape as a whole, I find myself visually bewildered. On the one hand, it looks like a coherent figure, an orderly arrangement of cubes, but it is also at the same time, a piece of visual nonsense. Each of these ways of experiencing the, the image continually reasserts itself. My eye moves back and forth across the figure, experiencing its apparent coherence in one instance, in instant, it's visible incoherence in the next, and so on, endlessly oscillating. With attention, I can slow the oscillation, but I can't eliminate it. Both poles persist. This is quite unlike the experience I have of an ambiguous figure, such as the Necker cube. The Necker cube is bistable. It can be seen as picturing two different shapes, each of which is perfectly coherent. But I see Reutersverd's picture is depicting only one shape, a shape that I experience as both visually intelligible and visually unintelligible. The result is a striking and irresolvable visual dissonance. There are, of course, other features of the image to attend to, for example, the delicate and precise freehand rendering of the cubes and the way the center of the triangle forms a six-pointed star, something I admittedly didn't notice until it was pointed out to me. But I have to make an unusual effort, it seems, to appreciate these things. It feels as if my eye will not rest until it has first made sense of the image, which at the same time resists every attempt to make sense of it. In this respect, I feel myself visually drawn to the image, but also visually repulsed by it. It both attracts and deflects the eye. Now I wanna compare a very different image, but a comparably geometrically simple image. Tony Smith's free ride. This is a minimalist sculpture. And here is a cardboard model of this sculpture, which is actually in black steel. And it's six feet, eight inches tall, uh, six feet, eight inches wide, and six feet, eight inches 
long. So consider this photograph of a cardboard model, a free ride. What happens when you visually engage with this picture? What do you do? Perhaps like me, you begin by following the contours of the figure and then you move your gaze back and forth to examine the relationships between the three segments. Knowing that they are of equal length, you might find it interesting that the middle segment looks shorter than the others and you might savor and explore this visually. It's a well-known, it's a version of a well-known optical illusion. You might also attend to the relationships between light and dark, to the figure's surprisingly dynamic character and so on. As it turns out, there's quite a bit to be seen in even this simple figure. Critically, however, and this is the main point, free ride produces nothing like the visual dissonance that Rogers Verde's triangle stimulates. Smith's sculpture may be visually interesting, but it doesn't seem to pose any special much less irresolvable visual problems. So we've considered these two and I wanna consider a third object, Jackson Pollock's number one. This painting offers nearly limitless opportunity for visual exploration. But like the Smith sculpture, it poses no special, much less irresolvable visual problems. Of course, there's no way to resolve the Pollock into something visually manageable. Like the Rogersverd, it resists all attempts at visual management. But it does so very differently. After all, when something visually chaotic resists visual management, there's no visual surprise, no tension, no dissonance. This is very much unlike the Rogersverd. So the point of exploring these three different objects and the experience of them is simply to highlight the fact that impossible figures give rise to an experience of distinctive and extreme visual dissonance. This means that we can now reformulate the question about the visual appeal of impossible figures in this way. Why would anyone want to look at something that it triggers such an experience? What's the appeal? In the final section of my talk, I'm gonna offer an empirically grounded hypothesis to explain this. Uh, let me just see how am I doing here on time. Okay, here we go. All right, so this is gonna be in three steps. First, I'm gonna talk about vision and visual dissonance. Second, I'm gonna introduce curiosity and confusion. And then I'm going to bring those two things together. I'm gonna to introduce the idea of visual curiosity and confusion and talk about how those play a role in understanding what's going on in, or help us to understand rather, what's going on in the case of impossible figures. So I'll start with a kind of skeptical worry. I've suggested that the experience of looking at impossible figures involves visual dissonance. And you might be concerned about this. You might say that, no, the dissonance isn't visual. And you might be motivated to say this by a view on which the visual system functions like a camera. I'm gonna call this the camera model. The, on this view, the visual system just registers light and color, line and shape. It doesn't do anything else. It just, as it were, makes the picture. It's altogether indifferent in this respect to what, if anything, it represents. Thus, if we experience any dissonance or conflict in looking at an impossible figure, it can only be the result of forming a belief about what we see, right? It's not built into the seeing itself. Compare looking at optical illusions. Right? When you look at the Muller Lyer lines, there's no visual dissonance here. If there's any dissonance to be savored or explored or enjoyed, it's the conflict between your knowledge that the lines are of the same length and the visual appearance that they are not. And what's interesting about looking at optical illusions a lot of the time is that the visual experience, right, is not cognitively penetrable. 
Um, the fact that we know that they're the same length doesn't change how they look. And that makes for an interesting experience, cognitive perceptual dissonance. But I think that we should reject the view of vision and of perception that underlies this idea. We should reject the camera model. The visual system doesn't blindly register the contents of its environment. It doesn't blindly register um, uh, those contents and just produce a picture indifferent to its content. Instead, it processes sensory data with a very specific aim to produce coherent representations of 3G objects arrayed in space. So this is at the foundation of David Marr's revolutionary work on the visual system. In other words, right, the visual system is tasked with making 3D sense of the information it takes in. And to do this, it follows a set of rules that in most circumstances yield good results. The problem is that in the case of Reutersberg's images, when the visual system applies those rules to the sensory information it receives, it's unable to realize its goal. Instead, the way that I think of it is, is that it gets stuck in a sort of processing loop. So let's compare the Smith and Pollock here. The Smith sculpture is a simple, regular geometric shape with which the visual system has no difficulty at all. The Pollock painting is by contrast visually chaotic, but again, the visual system has no difficulty because it doesn't even try to visually resolve the painting into a picture of a 3D scene. Note I'm talking about the visual system trying to resolve the painting right, into a picture of a 3D scene. That's different from spectators then looking at the painting and trying to find something depicted in it. Right. That's a separate step. That's not the visual system doing that by itself. This is you trying to see this as depicting something. right? which apparently I've been told um, is one of the reasons why Clement Greenberg right, decided that, that, that Pollock was good, right, but color field painting was better because that really aims at flatness. So um, here though, in the end, right, the idea is that from the visual perspective of the visual system, we've got fluid processing. By contrast, the Reuters Fed seems to promise the visual system easy processing of simple 3D shapes, but it immediately throws a wrench in the works. So the visual system tries again, only to meet the wrench again, and so on. Endless difficulties, endlessly disrupted visual processing. So in sum, should we say that there's real visual dissonance here? I think the answer is yes. The distance we experience in looking at Rogers Wright's triangle is not the result of judging or believing that such triangles are impossible. The dissonance is a product of and manifest in visual experience itself. And indeed, there's pretty compelling empirical evidence for this. If what I'm saying is correct, right, then we should find sensitivity to impossible figures among creatures who don't have the concept of impossibility, don't have geometrical knowledge, generally might be lacking in conceptual capacities. Indeed, it's been shown that four month old infants reliably discriminate between pictures of possible and impossible objects and give greater attention to the latter. And I think this is just what we should expect if impossible figures disrupt visual processing in the way I suggest. Okay, so that's one way in which I think we should reject the um, the camera model, right, is that the camera model um, doesn't have this kind of sense-making view of visual experience built into it. Um, so that's one shortcoming of the camera model. But something that's been left out of the, the conversation here already entirely is affect. And presumably affect is gonna have to make its way into this discussion if we're gonna somehow capture the appeal of impossible figures. Well, the camera model of vision not only treats visual processing as passive registration rather than a form of sense making, it also alienates visual processing from affect. Basically, the idea is this, right? Visual processing produces visual representations to which we then may or may not have cognitive and affective responses. What I've argued so far is that visual processing already has built into it a kind of sense making activity 
and is constitutively a form of sense-making activity. But in fact, there's also evidence that affect is an integral part of perception, mirroring the success or failure of very basic perceptual stages. In other words, disruptive perceptual processing actually feels bad. And notably, Topolinsky et al. demonstrated this in part using impossible figures in a series of like, really interesting experiments. Now though, our question becomes if clearer, perhaps even more pressing. Why would anyone wanna look at impossible figures if it feels bad to have visual processing disrupted in this way? And here's where curiosity enters the picture. So uh, in the empirical domain and empirical psychology, uh, the kind of the, the, the grandfather of um, uh, work on curiosity is D.E. Berlein. And in his work, Berlein distinguishes between epistemic curiosity and perceptual curiosity. Epistemic curiosity, according to Berlein, aims at knowledge and is found primarily and perhaps exclusively among human beings. On the other hand, perceptual curiosity, he thinks is found among a wide variety of animals. So what does he think perceptual curiosity is? Well, like many mid 20th century psychologists, Berlein was a behaviorist and had a camera-like view of perception as the mere registration of a sensory stimulus. Thus for him, perceptual curiosity could only aim at increasing stimulation of the animal's receptors. That's all it could be. But we can then ask, what happens to the notion of perceptual curiosity if we abandon the camera model and replace it with a view of perception as a form of sense-making? In that case, you can just schematically represent the difference this way, that epistemic curiosity aims at making conceptual sense of things. Perceptual curiosity aims at making perceptual sense of things. And I've already given you um, a clear sense in which vision aims at making a kind of visual sense. You might be curious about how that might work in the case of other modalities. And we can maybe say something about that at the end. Okay, so um, now we have a notion of perceptual curiosity that aims at making perceptual sense of things, but um, not just anything, right, provokes curiosity. Curiosity is provoked only by things that strike us as novel, but not all novel things provoke curiosity. So what else is required? Well, here I want to introduce you to a, a really, I think, really compelling and very interesting um, model of curiosity and confusion. Uh, curiosity is used interchangeably with interest here. This is um, from the work of Paul Sylvia. And, um, the idea here is that what we have is a two-dimensional um, uh, appraisal model of confusion and curiosity slash interest. The idea is this, that you encounter a novel stimulus and that can produce either confusion or interest, that is curiosity, depending on how you assess your ability to understand the item. So if you assess your ability to understand it as low, then you will experience confusion. If you assess your ability to understand as high, then you'll experience interest. So in one of his experiments, Sylvia gave some abstract difficult poetry to subjects. And of course, this struck them as uh, highly novel, um, but they assessed their coping potential, their ability to understand here as low, and they reported feeling confused. But then they were given hints as to how to interpret the poem. Given those hints, they felt like they had some kind of hook, some kind of in, some kind of, they assessed their ability to understand the poem, their coping potential is higher, and now they reported being curious and interested. So my proposal is that we can apply this model or adopt this model for visual curiosity. 
and perceptual curiosity more broadly. So we would have the same structure, but when the left, we would have visual confusion. On the right, we would have visual interest. Both of those would be provoked by things of high visual novelty, complexity, or unfamiliarity, not by things of low visual novelty and so on. And when you encounter something visually novel, whether you experience, as it were, visual confusion or visual interest will depend on whether you experience a low ability to make visual sense or a high ability to make visual sense. It'll depend on your, as it were, visual coping potential, your assessed visual coping potential. So let's see how this works in the case of Rochesvart's triangle. To begin with, we do experience this as novel in Sylvia's sense. At the same time, right? Uh, so it looks like a simple arrangement of cubes, right? But it also looks incoherent. So it certainly seems, and these are Sylvia's words, obscure, uncertain, mysterious, contradictory, unexpected, or otherwise not understood. Next, insofar as the figure disrupts the visual system's attempt to resolve it into a picture of a coherent 3D object, the experience of novelty becomes an experience of visual confusion. And affectively, this is unpleasant. On the other hand, insofar as the picture, uh, the figure looks like a picture of a simple arrangement of cubes, it promises visual intelligibility. Its simplicity promises intelligibility. And so the experience of novelty becomes an experience of visual curiosity. Affectively, this is present, pleasant. This is the best emoji I could find for, you know, uh, for, for interest or curiosity. So we have on the one hand, visual confusion, on the other hand, visual curiosity. And my suggestion is um, that what we experience in engaging with the image is a kind of oscillation between these two, two poles. So we end up with a kind of bivalent dynamic visual experience. Our visual sense-making capacities are stimulated only to be thwarted and thwarted only to be stimulated again and again. So we end up with a kind of endless cycle of visual curiosity and confusion. And in this respect, impossible figures are objects of endless visual interest. So, Let's return now to this question of the visual appeal of impossible figures. There are two routes you might take if you think that my account of the experience here is correct. First, you might adopt what we might call a compensation model on which curiosity compensates for the unpleasant experience of confusion. On the other hand, you might adopt what we might call a savoring model on which we savor the play of curiosity and confusion. And here I'm um, adopting the language of savoring that Carolyn Korsmeyer uses in her 2011 book, Savor and Disgust. Well, I think anybody who enjoys these pictures is going to say, you know, the compensation model is just phenomenologically inept. Really what I enjoy is or what I value, what I find satisfying and engaging here is precisely the play of curiosity and confusion. And um, I don't think that uh, um, that's, let me put it this way, that's in part what, that, that, that's what makes the experience interesting is precisely this play of curiosity and confusion. Interesting and something to be savored. All right, so that's my account, my proposal. And um, I wanna include, conclude by um, uh, mentioning two things about how we might move beyond thinking merely about impossible figures. Um, first, you might think about visual curiosity and confusion in visual art generally. Uh, I think that there's a lot of work to be done in thinking about um, how visual curiosity and confusion, as I've described them, uh, might be deployed to explain what's going on in our engagement with visual art. Uh, 
I think that the idea that visual processing is a sense-making and affectively loaded activity, already early visual processing uh, is something that should inform our thinking about how we engage with visual art and with visual aesthetics in general. Um, the second thing is perceptual curiosity and confusion in other modalities, especially hearing. Um, indeed, even in thinking about the way in which um, perceptual curiosity and confusion might function in uh, multimodal um, cases. So for example, uh, in, in film, um, probably most, most obviously. And I think with respect to hearing alone, um, thinking about how uh, auditory curiosity and confusion might be involved in uh, understanding the auditory appeal of certain types of music and certain musical phenomena. There I've done almost no thinking about this, um, but I'm pretty convinced that if you were to dive into the really huge literature on music cognition, um, that you would begin to find things that might fit together with this picture. So um, uh, I'm going to conclude then finally by with one example uh, of a, uh, you know, a canonical visual artwork. Um, and that's um, this piece by Joseph Albers, uh, Tenayuga One from 1942. Uh, I saw this um, live in, um, in New York at the, at the Guggenheim a number of years ago. There was an exhibition. Uh, called uh, Albers in Mexico, which was fantastic. And uh, I hadn't seen a bunch of this Albers stuff that was, you know, I'd seen the homage to the square series, but I hadn't seen a bunch of this more geometrical, um, these more geometrical explorations. And um, it immediately struck me that there was a, that Albers was, was working with and playing with, I think some of the same types of experiences that uh, I think that, that Rogersverd is working with and playing with. So just, I'll give you one example from this image, but I think there are other places where you might look at this. I think that to begin with, this picture um, presents itself as a picture, as a depiction, as um, representing an object. Uh, it doesn't present itself merely as a, um, you know, uh, uh, colored shapes on paper. So, uh, and, and moreover, the, um, the upper right-hand part here seems to present itself, uh, seems to represent something like a, a building, a structure, a cube, um, or a, 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 you know, a 3D rectangle of, of, of some sort, right? Um, and uh, so I experienced this part here as oriented vertically. And this seems to be something like a plaza or a square or like the, the space in front of the structure. And so I experienced this visually as horizontally oriented. But there's a problem visually that the picture then creates for you, which is how do you experience this space? In my eye, the way that I experience it is visual, uh, vertically and horizontally. And so I experience a kind of visual dissonance that's internal to the picture itself, it seems to me or internal to, you know, it's, it's not that I'm, um, it's not that it's ambiguous between these two interpretations. It seems that the picture as it were forces both of them simultaneously on me, incompatible interpretations simultaneously. So I'll end there. Thank you very much.